Jeremy for IncanExpeditions.com and I'm here at the Capulia Mirador in the beginning of the Chokakidao Trail. But I'm not going to stop at Chokakidao. I'm going to continue on to Machu Picchu on original Inca trails. So stay tuned. From complete solitude at Chokakidao to utter madness at Machu Picchu, we'll experience the highs and the lows of the Andes. Sometimes I take the easy way out, and sometimes I go the hard route. And I always adjust my tarp shelter to my surroundings. We'll also feel the dusty heat of the end of the dry season, and the miserable and dangerous conditions of the beginning of the rainy season. And when I have to cross that landslide on foot, welcome to another adventure and to a hike, which is probably my favorite of all time. Why? Because this is the only route which connects the two major ruined Incan cities. Prepare yourself for a journey which will take us over two mountain ranges and across three routes, and through subtropical brush to high jungle climate zones. Strap on your trekking shoes and be sure to pack only what's necessary. This is Chokakidao to Machu Picchu. We begin at the Capulillo Mirador. A mirador is a lookout or viewpoint. Here you can get the best possible view of the neighboring Padreyoc mountain when it's not as foggy as it is now. The main difference between the two cities is tourism. Machu Picchu is readily accessible and can get very crowded, while Chocoquirao is still hard to reach and less popular. This trail I'm currently on now is not an original Inca trail. It was created to reach Chocoquirao from Cachora. These guys are arrieros and they're using both horses and mules to transport goods from the town of Cachora to communities and campsites further down the trail. The fog begins to clear and I get my first views of today's descent. In the far distance, I can already see Marampata, and to the left, Chokakirao. I can also now kind of see Padreyoc and neighboring Coriwairachina Mountains. Time for some coffee. Just as I'm ready for a break, I find a bench at a Condor lookout, and then I realize I forgot my morning coffee. Oh, delicious. No sugar, no cream. Like Machu Picchu, Chokakirao was never discovered by the Spanish. And it was also visited by the discoverer of Machu Picchu, Hiram Bingham, in 1909. But unlike Machu Picchu, it's not easy to reach, and you can still get a feel of being one of the first visitors, something Machu Picchu has long left behind. I happen to look back towards the Condor lookout and can just barely catch one flying directly above me. So it's back and forth and back and forth until I move down into thicker scrub. Well, it's warm and muggy and I'm sweating a little bit, but I wouldn't call this a jungle heat. It's more like a subtropical. In fact, let's call this subtropical chaparral. Plants have defense mechanisms which can be less obvious when it comes to naturally produced chemicals and more obvious when it comes to tough skin and bark. Even more obvious, thorns, which are modified branches, and spines, which are modified leaves. In this shot, we can see four different species, each with their own version of defense against herbivores and insects. These are prickly pears, the cactus fruit, also known as tunas in Peru. They'll be ripe to eat around March. I continue moving down into the canyon now getting my first view of the extremely low river level of the Apurimac. I reach another viewpoint called Coca Masana with a sticker covered sign. Not only is the sign covered in graffiti, but so are the century plants. This succulent puts out a single flower stalk once during its lifetime, which requires all the energy it has left. This is uh, salvia and the mint family. And anything in the Lamiaceae family, mint family, is square. So if you take your finger and rub it like that, it'll feel like a toothpick. And then you'll know it's in the mint family. All right, enough about plants. Let's get going. Where we're going is down here. It's called 
Santa Rosa Baja on the other side. Follow that straight up to Marampata and follow that straight over behind the clouds and the crux over there, which is Chokikirao. Further on down the trail, I run into some stragglers. Yeah. The owner's somewhere up ahead, so I'm doing him a favor. It's buggy out, as you can tell with all the tail movement. These guys can carry about 70 kilos each, but they don't do so well carrying weight downhill. If you want to ride one, you'll have to ride it uphill and then walk downhill. At this point, there's a place you can camp here. I'm not sure if he's there anymore. Down here, way down here where there's smoke, that's Chiquisca. And further past, there's a landslide. You can see a line coming down the mountain, uh, which is where Playa Rosalina is. And that's the, that's the third campsite. And that's where I hope to get to today. I've stayed here before. It's got a nice view down the canyon, but you've got to walk a little bit to get your water. The rule is, even if no one's home, you can stay there. There just aren't enough flat areas for camping. I continue on and it's getting hotter the deeper I get into the canyon. Here's the kind of rest stop that you're looking for. It's in the shade and it's got that incline for the backpack support. Great news, I've got zero kilometers to go. I've found the smoke and now we're at Chiquisca. This is as touristic as it gets, with two restaurants, hostels, and Wi-Fi. Rocco even has a hot shower for a few solas extra, and he has camping terraces with a view of Padre York. It's a nice spot to cool off, water your horses, and have a cold drink. As a reminder, this is a solo shoot, so I have to come back and get that camera every time. Here's a look at what we're up against tomorrow. Welcome to Switchback Hill. And this is less than half of the way up to the ruins. Well, I'm pretty spent and dehydrated. There was a couple who uh, they spilled their water, so I gave them some water. And so I'm getting pretty thirsty now. But the good thing is, the river's just down here. So in a few more minutes, I'm gonna reach the river and fill up my bottle. I've never seen the river so low. It's November and the very end of the dry season. We're almost there and I'm really starting to feel the pinch on my toes from walking downhill for so long. Finally, it's flat, but the afternoon wind has picked up, which is worsened by funneling through the canyon. I've reached Playa Rosalina, a campsite I've always wanted to stay at. Okay, this is Playa Rosalina, and it's been abandoned. At first glance, it doesn't look too bad, but then the tuna cans start popping up. Sardines, tuna, tuna, tuna. More, more, more. If you forgot your alcohol stove, you're covered. See how nice the fire pits are? So when I got here, I was really thirsty. And so I went around and I checked all the spigots and there's just nothing, nothing coming out. After more searching, I find exactly what I need. It comes straight up from the ground after being somewhere tapped into the mountain. That's uh, shower, uh, dishes, um, drinking, uh, rehydrating food, it's everything. And I don't have to go down to the river. What a blessing it is. This is the cleaner side of Rosalina the administrative side. I've even got a nice table to put my gear and a bench to have lunch. And a bucket to wash my clothes. Okay, I've had my hose shower and washed my clothes and now I'm setting up camp. So here's what it looks like. Now I'm a big fan of using whatever's available when you go to set up camp. Well, what do we have here? It did have a family of spiders living in it, but I've got my plastic. And besides, they're not getting through the mosquito net. Voila, and guess what? I slept like a baby. There's the trail, and here's my camp. A couple of wooden shims keep the shock cord from sliding down the post. And on the other side, it's just tied off to one of the jail bars. 
A little section of plastic tubing tied off with shock cord to a rock helps open up my bug net. And here's tonight's view. The next morning I crossed the river. This landslide that happened about eight years ago, when it happened, flooded, blocked the river, and then flooded the campsite we were just at. Can you imagine what a nightmare that would have been for anyone staying at the camp at that time? Rosalina used to be the official campsite which was included with your Chokakitao entrance ticket. Looking back where we came from in the direction of east-southeast, and now west-northwest on the Apurimac River. Well, it's time to head up. And when I say up, I mean straight up. It really is a crime that this trail is marked in kilometers when it really actually should be in altitude. With every little section I climb, I look back towards the river to reward myself with small accomplishments. I'm beginning to look up to see how much is left, but you should never do this when hiking up a mountain. There's always more than you think. I'm also comparing my elevation with yesterday's descent on the other side of the canyon. I'm currently now a little higher than Chiquisca. The trail can get pretty narrow and with tight turns, so you have to be ready to step off at a moment's notice. These horses know the path and prefer to stick to the routine. I'm now moving at a snail's pace. The incline just won't let up. In Peru, I call this falso macho, or fake macho. Here we've got three young punks cussing up a storm, blaring the music, and throwing a giant boulder at this poor horse. Shame on your parents. The good thing is, the higher I go, the cooler it gets a little bit. I mean, it's noticeable, even though the sun is out. Looks like he's got the right idea. So I decided to join him. Santa Rosa Baja is just up around the corner, so let's follow him. Well, my friend is back. This time he joined me. Welcome to Santa Rosa Baja, a less than midway point between the river and Marampata. A group of about 13 biologists from the Ministerio de la Cultura arrived after I did. They're here to conduct research on animal populations, specifically behind Chokikirao at Pinchaya, New York. Alicia, who manages the site, is growing avocado, papaya, a type of passion fruit called grenadilla, and tomato. In addition to basic services, tents, prepared food, and chicha de jora, Santa Rosa Baja offers three terraces for camping. I've decided I've had enough for the day, so I'm gonna stay a night. Here's my tarp shelter, which uses modified tent poles, a super light tarp, plastic ground sheet, and that same hammock bug net that we use down at the river. It was between this and a single pole ultralight tent. For about the same weight, I went with the A-frame for better ventilation. I also get a lot more space inside and an excellent view. My tent camping days are probably behind me. In the distance is a mountain called Huamanripa, also known as Coisopacana. Above me, I'm just barely catching another condor and I'm fully zoomed in. Okay, so I cheated and decided to get a mula to get up to Marampata with my, my amigo Benito. And we'll be there in an hour and a half. Cuánto falta? Cinco kilometers. Y en una hora, una hora y media? Una hora y media. On the way, Benito's giving me pointers for the backside of Chokikirao. He tells me that the bridge to cross the river is now missing. Uh -huh. We got some rain last night, so it's kicked the dust down and it's made it really cool. So this is perfect weather for hiking, although I'm not doing that today. So today the goal is Marampata and tomorrow in the morning, the early morning, 
Choke it out. If you're older and not sure you can make the journey, mules and horses can make your trip possible. Benito and his compañero Rodolfo, who's up ahead of us, are using horses to transport batteries to use with solar panels at Chokikidao. Mules can carry up to 70 kilos. Any more than that's too much. So if you've got a big backpack like I do, you've got to get a mule to ride and a mule to carry your stuff. The switchbacks continue and then the horses have a break and a drink. As we climb more, you can see it's getting a little more cloudier. So mules and horses work the same here. Left for left, right for right, pull back on the reins to stop, kick them with your heels to go. And uh, these guys operate on a mula mula or a ch -ch -ch or a to get going. So the hikers are making fun of me, telling me that I have to walk, carry my stuff. But then again, they're not carrying stuff for six or seven days, so I'm gonna let myself get away with it. If you're planning on seeing the ruins and returning to Cachora, you don't need to bring any camping gear or food. Nowadays, hostels and meals are provided along the way. So that's Romulo. This is Blanco, and behind me, Benito is riding Rosita. All right, well, made it to Madan Pata with basically zero energy expended. And today we're just gonna stay at, uh, probably with Nicolasa, and she's got a place for camping and um, probably a hostel. Madan Pata is a small agricultural community which sits at about 2,800 meters above sea level. Many of the residents also cater to tourists, offering camping terraces and now hostels, electricity, hot water, prepared food, snacks, and sports drinks. This has become the place to stay as camping at Chokikidao is not currently allowed. From here, it's a two-hour walk to the ruins and a two-hour walk back. That means it's best to leave at 5 a.m. to get the most out of your day. Since I've never stayed here before, I decided to make the most of it and set up an afternoon shade shelter on one of Nicolás's terraces. Across the canyon is the community of Quinhuaya. Well, that's all I'm gonna do for today, and tomorrow we head to the ruins early. Seems like it could stay dry tonight, right? Nope. After dark, it came down hard and heavy, the first real downpour of the season. The following morning I leave early, carrying everything with me. I don't know where I'm gonna stay tonight. Maybe I can stealth camp at one of the sectors. So the first thing you realize after leaving Marampata is Paractepata, this sector here, sector 10, with 18 uh, terraces and parallel irrigation canals. Here is the old control where you used to buy your entrance ticket. So I begin that two hour walk, which is actually kinda nice. It's a well-deserved break from the extreme climbs and knee-breaking downhills. Soon we get a view of Sector 11. There are 80 terraces, and it's used for agriculture. And around the corner is the waterfall. Pakchayuk is the biggest sector of them all. Its name means the one with the waterfall. And here's the creek which feeds the waterfall. It's known as Quebrada Chuchumayu. It originates from the Coriwairachina Glacier and separates Chokikidao from Santa Rosa. I choose a lower path which bypasses the main entrance to take me down to the terraces. It takes a while to get down there because it's considerably lower than everything else. I get my first view of the waterfall and next to it, the house of the waterfall. But to get there, I'm gonna have to navigate the labyrinth of over 500 year old terraces. Let's see if we can figure out how to get down there. It 
It really is a maze with steep inclines and giant steps. All right, I can jump this. And then I'll just plow through this. And then I'll just climb up this. Last time I was here, I was just as confused. I'm sure the Inca farmer who used to live here had it all memorized. This is where he lived, right between the waterfall and terraces of Choclo. It was two stories high and built for the ages. The Incas would often incorporate niches in the architecture. The smaller niches would be used for significant objects, such as seashells, waidudo seeds, idols, and gemstones. And the bigger niches, well, mummies. Often the oldest ancestor of the family. I'm not sure if any of the niches here are big enough for mummies, but we'll see those later. The inside ledge around the top was used for making a platform, either for storage or for another level. And here's his view to the crops. Why would anyone need to stay right next to the crops? Well, I'll give you one good reason, which is still true today. The voracious parrots that come about 4.30 or 5 in the morning looking to rob you of what you've worked so hard for. And here was his own personal view to the waterfall. The Ministerio de la Cultura just doesn't get it because they keep letting that tree grow. And maybe this was his bathroom if there was some kind of plumbing. Either that or he was out helping to fertilize the crops. The constructions built during Pachacutec's reign share the same features known as the three S's. Solidity, simplicity, and symmetry. And what could this be? You got it. A complete walk-in bath with two-tier waterfall. Not bad. Time to move on. This is what it would have looked like between rainy seasons when the soil was freshly overturned for cultivation. And this is what it would have looked like when archaeologists began restoration. A complete nightmare to clear. I wouldn't call these steps. It's a ladder. It's straight up. The irrigation canals run down along the steps and straight out to the terraces. It's a mystical and peaceful place. One of my favorite sectors, but there's still more to see. After walking back up, I've reached the old campsite where dozens of tourists would have been camping for the night. But no one will be staying here as it's closed due to the pandemic. I continue uphill after dropping the weight. Well, I lucked out. I was able to leave my big backpack at the campsite. My direction turns to the southwest and towards the next sector. Now higher up, I can get a view of the waterfall and of the campsite. And there's the old ticket booth and trail to get here. And in the distance, Marampata. Chokiquirao can be completed as a circuit, so you're not retracing your steps. I suggest beginning at the lower agricultural sectors, up through the camping area, and to Pikiwasi. And from there, you can follow the trail around up to the central area. This is sector nine, thought to be living areas for families and for workers. It's widely accepted that Pikiwasi was a general living area for groups of people. Open areas such as this could be used as workshops for making textiles or ceramics. But determining what it was used for depends on what was dug up. You see those square holes on the ground? Those aren't niches. They resemble the guinea pig houses recently excavated at Inquiltambo. Now imagine you're a common worker living here at Pikiwasi and you've recently had some bad luck or you've got a sick cousin. Well, it's time to see the priest. This is the path he would take to see the priest. They were the ones who performed the ceremonies which offered blessings to cure your bad luck and offer more prosperity. They could also heal the sick with their knowledge of plants. They were also called upon for animal health and reproduction. Well, this is sector six where the priest lived. He's got one on one side and another on the other. And right away, you notice the difference with the niches. There's 
three niches here and a little niche there and a little niche up here. And up here somebody's left a little choclo. Even today, people still leave offerings to Pachamama or Mother Earth. Also known as Wasi Cancha or House Yard, the priest quarters has notably thicker walls than other structures and more niches, which held special objects related to the priest's practices. For example, they used conopas, which were carved stones in the shape of a llama or alpaca in which he would put the real fat of the animal inside to use as a blessing for good health and reproduction. Each house has an identical window, which frames the same mountain peak, which is currently hidden in clouds. Now let's walk out and see where a priest could spend his morning or afternoon. This is the best view of the surrounding canyon and mountain peaks, suitable for a priest because the Incas believed the mountains were alive and that they were gods. Time to move on, and another 15 minutes uphill, I reach the next sector. This is Sector 5, also known as Ushno, uh, a leveled summit uh, where they did ceremonies with a nice view, 360 degrees of everything, including the main plaza here. Okay, so Sector 1 is at the top. It's also called Hanan. Sector 2 is where the houses are, where the people are behind them. Sector 3 is the main plaza. Sector 4 is the lesser plaza in front of it. And to the right, Sector 7 are the terraces for agriculture. Facing the main plaza is an intricately designed yet confusing structure, simply known as Estructura para Ancestros. And yes, you guessed it, that's where your great 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 grandpa watches everything that happens in the plaza in mummified form. We'll come back here in a minute, but first let's go down to my favorite sector of them all. If you decide to visit, make sure you don't miss the Yama Terraces. Just like the agricultural sector, it takes some time to get down there on switchbacks. And when you finally reach it, you realize you're only at the beginning. Now, sketchy is a word, but scary is probably better at describing it. My feet don't even fit on the steps, so I have to move sideways. And don't even try it if it's wet and slippery. Most people prefer the switchback option, which was created afterwards, and is somewhere over on the left side. And going up these steps as opposed to going down is a much better idea. The sign in front of me marks the terrace which leads me to a lookout. After a few minutes and a short walk up some makeshift wooden steps, we've arrived. This is sector eight and the Yama Terraces. It's bizarre, isn't it? I think it's about 100 meters from the top to the bottom, and I just walked down about 60 of it. Now it's time to go back up. There are 80 terraces in total. And you know the stairs are steep enough, but to me, it seems like the terraces are higher than they are wide. It's not a comfortable place to be. It feels like you could fall off at any moment. It's time to head back up, but before we do, let's have a look at these yamas close up. The Incas used a white rock found in the same area and possibly chiseled a few here and there. There are both single yamas and mothers with babies. I don't think this had any ceremonial purpose, but it sure makes a nice pattern. Okay, it's back up the stone ladder. You see the irrigation canal on the right side? Now, you see the irrigation hole and canal I'm stepping over right now? I guess that's how it worked. Okay, just a little more effort to get back up to the plaza. Okay, this is sector three, the main plaza. And I knew I'd have it all to myself if I did the Yama sector first. So let's have a look. First, let's get this out of the way. This is the canal that comes down from sector one. This will become important tomorrow morning. 
From where Grandpa's mummy watches, let's visit another sacred place. Archaeologists know this type of construction well, but you can't find it everywhere. It's called the double niche. You've got the one and the two, which means it's special. So special, in fact, this room that I call the double niche room is actually called Cayanca de los Huayquis, which translates to House of the Brothers. You can only guess how many brothers there were. The mummies would go in the big niches, and above them, the smaller niche would hold an idol. The vertical rows of niches would hold iyas, or little statues of recreations of things the mummy enjoyed when the mummy was alive. The rings embedded in this row of niches were probably used for hanging objects, but their exact use remains unknown. What a beautiful door with a recessed jam and double transom overhead. The inside's not as pretty as the outside, but you can tell it's going to be here forever. And have a look at all the wonderful things growing on it. Don't you wish you had this in your garden? And in we go, and down a long corridor, which leads to the House of the Inca. This area is known to be La Casa del Inca, or Inca King's House. He was known as Sapan Intic Churin, which means the only son of the celestial sun. In every Inca city, the Inca king always had a place to stay, which is usually close to the temple because he was treated like a god. Unlike the other rings, these rings were most likely used for holding a beam across the door. These protruding stone posts were used for creating a second floor. And in my opinion, more deliberate mountain peak framing. These stone posts were used for attaching roofing material. And these bonder stones with circular eyes were thought to have worked as door hinges or locks. All right, it's time to grab the backpack and figure out the camping situation. But on the way, we're gonna hit sector seven, the giant terraces. The Incas built three kinds of terraces, for agriculture, for decoration, and for preventing erosion. Now I have no doubt these were used for agriculture, but I have a suspicion that their main purpose was to be used as retaining walls for the main plaza. Rain can do a lot of damage, and since restoration began in the 1970s, archaeologists have already repaired many of the walls. Looking up the steps, I count about four different levels. So what do you think? Purely for growing crops, or are they giant retaining walls? Here's the front gate since we bypassed it earlier. It's open from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we're back to the campsite with absolutely no camping allowed. A friend of mine was working today, so he let me stay. He did me a big favor, because otherwise it's two hours back to Marampata, and in the morning I've got to come back because I'm going to continue over the hill. And so I've got another campsite all to myself. Well, I don't know what you call this one, but it checks out. Hold on, it did not check out. It looks tight. It looks like it'll shed water off the sides and the front, even tied off to this tree for headroom. I'm still using the poles because they're supporting the bug net. But after about a half hour of rain, I decided to remove the poles and pull that left side out away from the terrace to make it straighter. Guess the terrace technique still needs some work. And it was a quiet and peaceful night up until the rain moved in. The next morning I head back up to the main plaza because we still have to see sector one. And everything's wet. Gears wet, tarps wet, I'm wet, my socks are wet. Everything I washed yesterday is still wet. Well, today from the ruins, we're gonna go up and over and to the backside, which is my favorite. I'm back past the big terraces and up through the main plaza. And then I just keep going straight up. We've arrived at the Colcas. Colcas were used for storage, for food, textiles, and weapons of war. They were generally located at higher elevations where temperatures were cooler, where the Incas tried to utilize refrigeration. The roofs would mostly have only one leaning side 
for purposes of channeling water. This is sector one, also called Hanan. More correctly pronounced, Hanan means upper in Quechua. Archaeologists number stones in a grid pattern before restoration. When they find a wall which is collapsing, they have to mark the stones with letters and numbers before further deconstructing so the rebuilding process can begin. These were most likely living areas. Hanan is a privileged area because of the location, as the people living here were the first to receive the channel of water. Also, being higher up meant they were closer to the gods. The people living here could have been high priests, astronomers, or members of the royal family. This deep niche held something really important, either a mummy or sculpture for rituals. This may be another storage area for something similar. And facing the central patio, a series of walk-in baths with the same style as the agricultural sector. And that looks like a great spot for yet another mummy. Well, it doesn't look like we're gonna have any of those nice panoramic views today. Remember when I said that canal was gonna be important? Well, here's why, cause it leads the way. Just keep following it up and right into this mess of subtropical jungle. Even when it seems to be getting worse. If you prefer a wider, more established path, there is another one which leads up from the Chokakidao entrance. I'm not carrying any water with me because of the weight, so I take advantage of the wet conditions. And bromeliads hold the most if you don't mind swallowing some bugs and tree litter. And we can just put that back for the next thirsty hiker. My little adventure trail meets up with the wider trail and I continue uphill. You know, just getting up a little higher from the ruins, there's no mosquitoes. It, it reminds me of a theory that I had of why the Incas lived where they lived, and I think part of the reason was to get away from mosquitoes. You can notice it at the campsite and around the central plaza and further down by where the priests are, um, but up at Hanan, the, the highest ruins, I didn't see any mosquitoes, and there's definitely none here. Just sitting here taking a break, I noticed this little hobbit's hole. This is probably from a Vizcacha in the Chinchillidae family. They kind of look like long-tailed rabbits. I finally reached the Chokikidao Pass at about 10,700 feet above sea level. And I'm now going downhill. We won't go uphill again until we cross the Rio Blanco. This original Inca trail connected Chokikidao to both Vilcabamba and Machu Picchu. Vilcabamba to the north and Machu Picchu to the north and then to the east. This route was used extensively for trade. In fact, the Incas didn't use money at all. They relied on a barter system where they would trade textiles, ceramics, metal goods, livestock, wool, skins, and even feathers. Normally, this is the best view of the entire trip, but unfortunately, it's not today. On a clear day, we can see for miles down the Apurimac Canyon to the west, or to the north and the Vilcabamba mountain range. And if it's really clear, we can probably make out the next ascent up into the Yanama Pass. But today, it ain't happening. So here's a panoramic shot I took a couple years ago. Enough of waiting for the weather to clear, let's keep on it. The switchbacks bring me down until I'm able to get a view of the Rio Blanco. And since we've gone down in elevation, the mosquitoes are back. It's also warmer and still wet, but we're almost there. And here we are at the next site, considered by some to be Sector 12 of Chokakidao. It's called Pinchayanuyak at about four kilometers and three hours outside of Chokikidao. There are 57 terraces, which are laid out similarly to the agricultural sector, sector 11, the first one we went to. The main difference would be is that it's not as steep, it's completely separate from the main ruins, but it still has running water. 
which makes it a great campsite. And yes, camping is allowed. At the top terrace, the construction which was built on top of this giant boulder was used for ceremonies. And there's that double niche. Ceramic shards, stone tools, and bone fragments have all been found on the upper terraces. Now that's all kind of interesting, but I'm just happy that it's flat, it's got water, and a nice view. Because I'm going to put my tarp right there. Alright, so I'm working on perfecting the terrace technique. Now I've got the right angle, and I can almost walk inside there. You see those rocks sticking out? The Incas built steps to get from one terrace up to the next, and they're perfect for hanging my clothes. This has got to be the most room I've had underneath a tarp when sleeping on the ground. And it's pretty much stealth camping, although it doesn't matter here. No ruins were damaged while I was setting up the tarp. This is what damages ruins. When you let those trees grow right out of the face, those roots expand and they break it up. It clears up a little bit, so I decide to scope out what's coming next. Okay, from here you can kind of see what I'm gonna be doing tomorrow. From the river down here, I'm gonna be taking these switchbacks and then when you get up into this area, there's a fork. If you go left, it takes you up to the usual campsite, which is up here. If you go right, it takes you along to uh, Zacharias' house where he grows choclo, where that burnt square is. And he's got a house there with terraces. To the right is uh, further is Romlo's house. And then the next day, I'm gonna follow the trail along this, uh, past the Victoria Mines, and then up over the Yanama Pass. Well, I didn't get it totally right. The burnt section is actually past both Zacarias and Romulo, but we'll figure it out. Down the Apurima Canyon, it's blue, blue sky. So I hope we get some of that tomorrow. Oh, little did I know, the rest of the trip would be miserably wet. The following morning, after a quick shave, I leave everything out to dry, and then the moisture moves in again. It's looking just like yesterday. And we're off again. If you're planning on climbing all the way up the other side, it's best to leave early. My goal today is just the river. The total walking distance from the Capulillok Mirador to Yanama is only about 27 miles, but it's the elevation that gets you. The first descent is about 5,000 feet, and the first ascent is about the same. The second descent is about four and a half thousand, and the second ascent is more than 7,000 feet. And the final descent to Yanama is less than 2,000. Now you can do this whole trip much faster than I am, especially if you're not carrying your own gear or stopping to take pictures every 10 minutes. On day one, you can make it from the Mirador to either Santa Rosa Baja or Marampata. On day two, you can make it to Choquequerao and maybe even Pinchay Nuyo. On day three, you can make it to Maisal. In day four, you can make it to Yanama. If you'd like any help organizing your trip, you can email me in the description. Okay, we've arrived at Rio Blanco, and I'm just gonna go the usual way, but hold on, something's different. The trail's been wiped out by the river, so let's double back. After a little confusion, I guess I figure it out. Okay, now watch how cool I am. This is what happens when you get lazy. Well, I guess it's time to dry everything out again. And wet shoes for tomorrow. We begin the drying process. Further down river, I find some cairns which are marking the way. And even further still, I find a nice little flat spot which looks to be rock free. So I'm headed straight for it. But before I get there, I find something else. Dry boots, but Peruvian size. So this will have to do, unless I want to sleep on the trail. To one side is a smaller creek 
and to the other, a bigger creek. In another month or so, they'll join forces. In fact, that's what took out that bridge that used to stretch right across there. You see that trail? I'm in the deep background trying to pull that tent straight. The tent poles are sinking in the sand, so it's not cooperating. This is looking downriver towards Abancay and upriver towards Cusco. Once you get those chores done, the rest of the day is yours. The next morning I cross the river like a little girl. Yeah, but I'm tired of being wet. And up into the sky again we go. They're hard switchbacks. And every so often, I pause to take in the view. I reach a sign that says Bosque Relicto, which means an endemic species can be found here, so it's protected. Now it's steep, but it's wide enough for me to make my little mini switchbacks. Just make diagonal cuts from the left to the right side, and it'll help take some of the pain off of your legs. On the opposite side of the canyon, I can see a small group now heading down to that river. It looks like a couple with the tour guide in front of them. And a half hour later, I can see the horses and gear following from behind. In horticulture, this is known as lantana, and you can find it all over the subtropical and high jungle areas of Peru. I find a pillar of birds which are catching a draft. And this little disgusting white worm, and I still can't figure out what it is. Then there were three of them, but I only had enough time to catch the third. Now isn't that graceful? Their big bodies need that updraft coming up off the cliff. You rarely see a condor flap its wings. But for me, I'm running out of energy. This is hard work. I'm hoping to get to my destination soon. But the view seems to make up for it. Well, I've reached about the same elevation as Pinchai Nuyuk, which is that triangle section just to the left of the deeper ravine. Well, this is the fork to get to Zacarias, and possibly the original Inca Trail, but nobody's been using it, and I'm not going through that, so we're just going to continue up this way. No way am I going in there. It hasn't been used in a long time. Trails get grown over. They also get created. There might be another way to get over to the right side further up. Here's a quick look back at the last descent since we won't have this angle again. Okay, decision time. To the left is Valentin and that small camping group and to the right, Zacarias and Romulo. Now I'm out of coffee and a prepared meal sounds great, which I know Valentin has but I'm enjoying having the campsites all to myself, so let's go right. I'm faced with another choice, left or right. It's always a gamble, because it could just get worse, which it does. I switch back to the left and find a house, but it's not Zacarias. So I was looking for Zacarias' house, uh, and I ended up here at this another house called Familia Perez, and I think it's Romulo. Um, I got confused with all the clouds, and I can't see over here, I can't see there. I got confused with the trails. Um, so, but I'm out, I'm out of gas. There's nobody here, but uh, this is this is it for today. I'm done. It's just in time because I can't do any more. We've landed and it's beautiful. Romulo's terraces have four levels, all wide enough for your tent, and all with a fantastic view of the waterfall. And right away, I notice something new. There's this trail that's been cut into the mountain, and it's right here. Looks like somebody's project. 
The next day I actually found out what it is, so stay tuned. This is a picture of Zacarias in case you decide to stop by, but his house is higher up from where I am now. The clouds move in to form a window to the Cody White Achina Glacier, which sits somewhere between 16 and 17,000 feet, and it feeds the waterfall all year long. Tomorrow we're going to head to the right along these mountains and then up to the San Juan Pass. Here's another view of the descent over the last couple of days and another look at the community of Kinwaya. More easily heard than seen, a flock of parrots crossed the canyon in the late afternoon. I still can't get my socks to dry, but it's too late because the sun is already setting. I'm up early, and I follow the little sign which says Yanama. I grab a stick to clear out the spider webs before they latch around my face. The thing that was getting to me the most this morning wasn't the wet shoes without socks, although I hate that, it was the spider webs strung across, and every few seconds you get a new one, a new one, a new one. But luckily, I had a a couple of arrieros and about six horses come through and those big horses cleared the way. It starts out pretty flat and then there's a little bit of a climb and then you run into this cave which kind of looks natural but it's not. It's a remnant of the Victoria Mines. But we've still got a long ways to go up before we reach there. It's misty and exotic but just plain wet, and it gets wetter. Well, I wanted to stop and rest a few times, but if I do, I'll get a wet backside and I'll start to get cold. And it gets steeper. I just did about 15 to 20 switchbacks, uh, but things, uh, at that steepness or worse, uh, but things might be looking up. Not only am I getting rained on, but I'm catching all the drips from all the overhanging foliage. But these black backed gross beaks don't seem to mind it at all. After more climbing, I'm wet and tired, but the environment finally starts to change. I move from a lusher green to a scrubbier climate zone. until I finally run into some Ichu grass, which only grows at the higher elevations. The pass can't be much further up now. Up ahead, it's a pile of rubble, leftovers from mining, and we've reached the Victoria Mines. I find some quartz, which is evidence of mineralization, and an abandoned generator, and multiple tunnels. We're almost to the pass, but unfortunately there's more climbing. It really is a shame to come do this hike without the views because that's the big payoff. Um, it's just too much moisture. If you're going to come do this hike, make sure it's between May and October and you should be fine. I can't stress enough the importance of coming here during the dry season when the views are worth the effort. Okay, now, remember that cutout trail in front of the waterfall? These are the people who are working on it. They are working on a new route to choke a kid out, which is more direct. What normally takes a couple days will only take a few hours. In the future, people will visit choke a kid out from the backside instead of Cachora and the route I just took. This means you'll probably be able to see both Machu Picchu and choke a kid out in about four days. Finally at the pass at about 17 and a half thousand feet, 
with views of nothing else but clouds. Normally the views here are nothing less than spectacular, but not today. This Yanomanian found a great spot for cell phone reception. In town, it doesn't work so well. You can actually hear his whole conversation clear as a pill. All right, it's time for our final descent. I'm anxious to get down and get dry, so I pick up the pace. But I'm not gonna have to go down as much as I came up yesterday. If the Rio Blanco is at about 6,000 feet and Yanama is at about 11, it's only about half the distance up to the pass. And Cusco is just about the same as Yanama at just over 11,000 feet. I reached the tunnels of San Juan. There's about four of these. And next, the cliffs. You know, on a clear day, this can get a little freaky. And around the corner, the final tunnel. And so I know now, it won't be long before we reach Yanama. And after a few more rocky cliff faces, I can finally see the sheet metal roofs of houses. And a little black pig on a rope who greets me. Okay, it's the next morning and I stayed with Abel and Margot. From Yanama, you can continue uh, along the trail and up over the Abra. But I'm done walking, there's another group couple people from the United States. They're done walking, so we're gonna take the car, which is here. And he says there's a landslide, so we're gonna go as far as we can and possibly have to walk. Um, so we'll see. So hopefully the car can get us all the way to Santa Teresa. Well, the Americans decided to keep walking, probably because they paid a lot for their tour. But luckily, there were a couple of Peruvians who also needed to get to Santa Teresa. If the driver can't find enough passengers, he won't make the journey. Unless you want to pay for something called express service, which isn't cheap. In the future, this may change depending on that new route to choke a out. So we're headed up to the Yanama Pass at over 15,000 feet. Cutting back and forth, up switchbacks with views of the Altiplano. One of the passengers hands off a rope to a family member. It looks like these guys are repairing the road, and you know what, they're gonna get real busy here with all the new rain. Now we're over the pass and headed downhill. I'm enjoying the views from the comfort of being completely dry and with a padded seat. Soon enough, we pass through Totora until we arrive at the community of Colpapampa. The place that you stop coming down from Salkantai which we'll do on another video. And it's the place that you come to before you head down towards the river, which goes this way, the Rio Santa Teresa, where it gets more tropical uh, before you reach Santa Teresa. After a quick stop for some hot tea, we're back in the van, but none of us know what's up ahead. We're either gonna be able to take this van all the way, or we're all gonna have to get out and walk over a landslide. We start to see workers in hard hats and a bulldozer, and it's not looking good. It's a chilling feeling. The whole thing could shift from underneath me, or I could catch a boulder or several from up above. The only comfort I have is that there's already a small trail of packed earth and rock. Best to just get over it as soon as I can. Well, I've been walking for about an hour. I haven't seen any cars. Uh, I might end up walking the whole way to Santa Teresa. Right now, I'm at Playa. You can see the sleeping domes down there for tourists that come in through the, through the route on the other side. Um, and Santa Teresa is not much further down here. And I might end up walking the whole thing today. We'll see. And a half hour later, I found a car. And I made it to Santa Teresa and stayed the night. The following morning, I took a quick van ride to Hidroelectrica. Well, I just got dropped off at the parking lot for the hydroelectric station, which is just down here. And you can see it's already looking uh, touristic. It can only get worse. From here, we're gonna go up the hill, and then we're gonna go up 
further and then we're going to cross a bridge and then from there it's about two hours of flat tracks like this. This is also the same walk you'll take when coming by the Inca jungle, Salcantay and Vilcabamba treks as well as Machu Picchu by car. Having to walk up this section tells you everything about what the river is doing and how it violently drops to create the necessary force to drive the hydroelectric station. We are now crossing the Urubamba River also known as the Huilcamayo in Quechua. And just like the Apurimac, the river level is extremely low. And this is normally a great spot for cast net fishing when there's water. I'm looking forward to it because I know what's up in front of me. It's not too hot, it's not cold, there's plenty of shade, and it's nice and flat. They've got to be the loudest species of bird out there. And it sounds like there's a hundred up in this tree but I can't see one until I get a little closer. They're green parrots, but I'm not sure on the exact species. Maybe mealy or yellow-headed. I start to make my way around the curve through the canyon. There's Huayna Pichu in the distance, and behind that, Machu Picchu. It's a nice walk and a good option if you'd like to get out of Aguas Calientes for a day. But you've gotta be on your toes since these are working tracks. This creek is the largest creek along the entire walk. It's worth mentioning because it's the same creek that runs down through the gardens of Mondor. And let's have a look at the source, which is about a 45 minute walk up from the gate. Now that's pretty powerful for the dry season. Moving on, and I counter another train which is most likely bringing supplies to and from Aguas Calientes. Now maybe it's from all the jungle bird watching, but I just happen to look over and catch a mot mot. One theory as to why he's swinging those tail feathers is to let me know it's not worth my effort to chase him. In other words, he could be showing me a pursuit deterrent signal. Nevertheless, I get close enough to watch him fly away. I've got to wait for one more train, which leads me to the train depot. You can either take the road down here, where the buses that take you up to Machu Picchu kick up dust, or you can take the tracks, like I'm doing. But you have to go through tunnels, and if you get stuck in a tunnel when a train's coming through, you have to squeeze up against the wall. So let's take this way because I don't want to suck in all the dust. Now I don't think you're supposed to walk through the tunnels, but I always have. Besides, it's kind of cool. Literally. And there's just enough light so you don't trip on any of the loose rock. Okay, here's the sign translation. It's prohibited for pedestrians to walk through the tunnel. Okay, well now we know. When you get to the middle of one of these tunnels, you realize there's no place to go. So the couple in front of me decide to make tracks. I finally get my first view of Aguas Calientes. And after two hours of walking on rubble, I see that civilization lies just ahead. And it feels good. And now it's official. Next stop, Machu Picchu. Well, as you could see, with all the chitter chatter, there was no way I could talk on camera. I couldn't even really stop. While people were pausing for selfies, the guards who worked there kept telling them to move on. And after more than a week of peace and quiet, this would turn out to be my biggest challenge yet. Okay, let's turn the noise down and start fresh while I try to film around the insanity. From the sun gate at the top in the crux, the Inca Trail leads down past the sacred rock into the ruins. Here are the tour buses you take to get up to Machu Picchu. And here are the switchbacks which lead up from Aguas Calientes. The trip takes about a half an hour. Now this peak is Machu Picchu, while this famous peak is actually Huayna Picchu. It has terraces near the summit which were probably built for erosion purposes. 
These are the upper terraces of the agricultural sector and top right, houses built for visitors to Machu Picchu. The Guardian's house was a watchtower for possible invaders, which could be coming through either the Intipunku path or by way of the path I took along the river. Here's the latest solution for soggy grass and heavy traffic. This is Putukusi Mountain, which used to be climbable from Aguas Calientes, but due to recent accidents, it's probably not allowed. From the agricultural sector, we can find a water supply canal, which runs right by the Temple of the Sun and House of the Inca. And here's the upper urban sector, which is close to the temples. And behind that, Intihuatana, which is built upon a truncated pyramid. And to the right, the eastern urban sector, and lower right, the Temple of the Condor. Here's the dry moat, which separates the agricultural sector from urban sectors and lies along a naturally occurring geological fault. It really helps with drainage during heavy rainy seasons. Down there in the canyon is the backside of Machu Picchu and the route I took to get here. Here's the main gate. It was the only entrance through the city wall which had a secure physical door. Every Inca city had a main gate. The Incas would tie rope around this stone post to hang a wooden beam across the inside of the door, which acted as a lock. On top, there's another ring which holds another beam vertically. Here are some shots of the upper urban sector. This type of construction was typical during the reign of Pachacutec, with trapezoidal niches, windows, and doors. The walls were also built with a slight inclination for any seismic activity. Just like at Chokakirao, we see protruding stone pillars, which were used for attaching roofing materials. Here's the Temple of the Sun, which served as a solar observatory where sunlight would enter the front window on exactly June 21st, South America's winter solstice. It would show at a specific point on the rock in the middle of the temple. The lower agricultural sector has 80 terraces, which some scholars believe are not filled with soil from the surrounding area, but brought all the way from the Sacred Valley. Now we're leaving the Temple of the Sun towards Huayna Picchu and the eastern sectors of Machu Picchu. There's Intihuatana, the Inca's sundial, which worked much the same way as the Temple of the Sun. Unfortunately, today it's closed. The separation in this wall was most likely caused by an earthquake, as there is no apparent sinking. You can see the top still lines up. These pipes lead down to the hydroelectric station, which supplies electricity even as far away as Cusco. And this is the quarry sector. Now looking up to the sacred plaza. This is the main temple, with its niches placed much higher than usual. Maybe they held fragile or ceremonial objects. Now the break in this wall was not due to an earthquake, but more likely erosion over time or a geological fault. Now this had already happened by the time Hiram Bingham first visited, but it wasn't as bad as it is now. The architecture of the sacred plaza is a little different than the rest of the structures at Machu Picchu. This is the temple of the three windows. You can tell it was a temple by the fine craftsmanship and polished walls. In 1902, Augustine Lizarraga engraved his name in the middle window, and later in 1911, Hiram Bingham tried to hide it. To the right is a receptacle, which held a wooden beam, which means it was roofed. Now, the eastern urban sector. What I notice is the roofing peaks resemble the mountain range behind them. Now that might be my theory, but a theory shared by most is that this rock, called the Sacred Rock, was carved by the Incas to resemble the mountain behind it, known as Yanantin. Here's the entrance to Huayna Picchu. If you'd like to include Huayna Picchu in your day at Machu Picchu, please book this at least three months in advance. And here's more of that Pachacutec style symmetry. Maybe I'm wrong, but the angle of that roof looks much too similar to the always present Huayna Picchu Peak. This is the artisan sector, where they made things like ritual and domestic ceramics. Here is the living area for common people, where the majority of structures were two stories high. The first floor was for living, and the second was usually for storage. This worker was hired by the Ministerio de la Cultura to remove any vegetation growing on the rocks. And here are the stairs to nowhere, and below, the Urubamba River. 
Machu Picchu is part of the Vilcabamba mountain range. Here, the base is original Inca construction, and at the top, archaeologists have used mortar to restore this wall. This is the mortar room, and probably the most interesting of them all. When Bingham arrived, a family living here was using these bowls for grinding corn, but this was not their original use. The Incas would fill them with water in order to observe a reflection of the stars. The stone pillars surrounding the room are set between the niches and most likely used for hanging objects related to astronomy. And here is a Vizcacha sitting underneath one of the wings of the condor sculpture in the temple of the condor. And here is the fountain sector which was for daily use either for drinking or for bathing. The baths connect in a series just like at Hanan at Chokikirao. And finally at the exit and part of the agricultural sector, kolkas or storage houses were used for crops like corn and potatoes after a harvest. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next hike to another ruined city.